Lolo is uh, uh, from uh, GGI, and um, and they will talk about uh, uh, the fate of long modes in cosmology. Uh, Rocco, you have 20 minutes, and uh, I'll give you a five-minute uh, warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, hi, everybody. I would like to thank all the organizers for this nice opportunity. Um, let me start with the outline of my talk. The first 10 slides, I will give you an introduction about primordial non gaussianity And thereafter, I will introduce you a controversial issue in the literature regarding the observability of primordial non gaussianity in single field inflation. I will give you the source of the problem and what is our proposal, our solution. And you can find everything in this paper, the science of long modes in cosmological observable, the paper written by me, Matarese, and Luigi Pio. So let me start with the a brief introduction and by fixing my notation essentially. Uh, consider that the starting point is always the cosmological principle that our universe seems to be more and more homogeneous and isotropic at sufficiently large scales. So the basic idea it is to solve Einstein equation perturbatively, which means that you hypothesize an homogeneous and isotropic background in addition to small anisotropies. And the background is given by the standard Friedman Robertson Walker metric. And this is the structure of the most general metric tensor around uh, uh, a Friedman Robertson Walker metric in a scalar vector and tensor decomposition. I don't want you to remember all this function, but please take care of the form of my metric three, my, uh, of my three metric tensor. Essentially, I have two scalars, the Newtonian potential phi describing the diagonal component. Uh, the, the out diagonal scalar E and the gravitational wave sector H. I will always neglect vector perturbation because they are not produced at first order in single field inflation. And consider that usually in cosmology we relate observable to frame dependent gauge invariant quantities. Uh, gravitational waves are naturally uh, gauge, uh, gauge invariant at the first order in perturbation theory. And for scalars, we define frame dependent generalization of the Newtonian potential called Karbash perturbation. I think that R is the most general, uh, cover, is the most famous Karbash perturbation, the Karbash law of constant velocity surfaces. But you can find the richer uh, zeta, which is the Karbash law of constant energy density, and so on. Now, I think that an important point is to understand what is the expected statistics of primordial perturbation. And now, if you consider that linear cosmology at the first order in perturbation theory is an excellent approximation of our universe at large scales, um, you expect the absence of phase, of phase correlation between modes with different wave number. And if you want, this is the starting point of a Gaussian statistics. Essentially, the uh, even end point function will be completely fixed by the two point function thanks to the width theorem, and odd end point function will be equal to zero. Now, if you consider second order perturbation theory and so on, you get no linearities and you get a small source of phase correlation, and that's a violation of Gaussian condition. And now let me introduce the simplest uh, inflation scenario given by single field inflation. It's uh, a scalar, the inflaton, minimally coupled with gravity. Imagine a potential with this form. You have a starting phase where the potential is very flat. The inflaton is low rolling down this potential. You can predict this, these two parameters, epsilon and eta, the rate of change of the Hubble in an Hubble time and the rate of change of the epsilon itself. They are predicted to be very suppressed due, during this starting phase, ensuring the quasi desiter expansion of the universe. And if you study first order perturbation, you immediately realize that the velocity potential of the media is proportional to the inflaton fluctuation. And that's the commoving Karbash perturbation is a frame independent generalization of both Newtonian potential and the inflaton fluctuation. We can study the two point function in Fourier space defining the so called scale invariant power spectra in the very large scale limit. We can realize that. Uh, the power spectra of R, zeta, or any other kind of Karbash perturbation, they are all equal to each other. And what you get? You get that the solution of the power spectra is, simple, is simply a power law. You have an amplitude, which is proportional to the Hubble constant square over M Planck square, one over epsilon. 
which is constrained by CMB to be very small, 10 to minus 9, you get that the scale dependent is defined by this tilt parameter. The tilt parameter is very close to one, a little bit smaller, and this is in good agreement uh, with the, the current experimental constraints. And now what about gravitational waves? You can define the two-point function. You have a very similar structure for its power spectra. You get that the two amplitude are proportional to each other thanks to the tensor to scalar ratio parameter, R, and it is predicted to be very suppressed. It's proportional to the epsilon parameter. And this is the tilt of the gravitational waves. Also in this case, it, it is a little bit smaller than one. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, we have only an upper bound for the tensor to scalar ratio, and the tilt is almost undetermined. And now, what about the simplest form of primordial non gaussianity given by the three-point function? In the scalar sector, you can define the so-called bispectrum in Fourier space. This is the historical parametrization of the bispectrum. It's proportional to an adimensional FNL parameter. The prediction of this FNL parameter is very complicated. In general, it is a scale-dependent function, and it is multiplied this permutation of the, of the power spectrum. We can try to measure the FNL parameter for different configuration in Fourier space, equilateral, folded, and squeezed. And these are the experimental plan constraints. As you can realize, the squeezes shape when one of the three momenta is much smaller than the other two is the best constrained one. And essentially, you can get that the FNL uh, can be equally close to zero as to something of order 10. And thus, the B spectrum is uh, at maximum 10 multiplied an object, which is of order 10 to minus 18. Thus, is, if our, our universe is, uh, is not Gaussian, it's extremely Gaussianized. And what is the famous single field, single field prediction? The so-called consistency relation, uh, obtained the first time by Baldassina in 2003 and estimated at the same time by Acquaviato. The squeeze the FNL of single field inflation is proportional to the tilt minus one. And remember that the tilt is very close to one. Thus, it is extremely suppressed. And now, what about gravitational waves? You can have three gravitons correlators, two gravitons and one scalar, one graviton and two scalar. If you want, you can define FNL-like parameter. Um, these are the very, very mild uh, constraint, experimental constraints about this parameter in the squeeze configuration. And these are the squeezed single field prediction. The common law is that more or less this FNL are always suppressed by the epsilon parameter. And this is a very peculiar feature of single field inflation. Uh, because if you consider more exotic models, the FNL uh, prediction is completely different. And thus the FNL detection is the smoking gun to discriminate different inflationary scenarios. And now can we detect this FNL parameter? You can imagine to improve the CMB experiment, but I, I want to talk about other two possibilities. One is given by the galaxy clustering. This delta G function is nothing else than the overdensity of galaxy in a local patch X in the sky at certain redshift. And quite intuitively, you can image that this function is biased by the underlying matter perturbation on much larger scale than the local patch. And the famous prediction with initial Gaussian condition is that this parameter is not scale dependent. But if you consider nonlinearities and the presence of uh, initial non-Gaussian condition, you get the prediction of Verden matter race in 2009 that you are building an effective bias parameter, which is scale dependent. And the scale dependent is proportional to the FNL of the delta function, which is minus 5 third plus the primordial FNL. And thus, if you believe in single field inflation, you expect to be sensitive in future uh, galaxy survey to this minus 5 third term. And similarly, if you consider the presence of gravitational waves, you get a similar correction of the halo bias scale dependence, which is proportional to the FNL of one graviton and two scalars. And now what about um, the optimistic, uh, if you want, uh, the future of gravitational waves detection? Um, we hope to be more sensitive to the isotropic gravitational waves background uh, because it is very sensitive to the value of the gravitational waves tilt determining the slope of these straight lines. And if you consider nt minus one greater than zero, 
which means beyond single feed inflation, we hope to intersect the ELISA sensitivity region. But if you believe in single feed inflation, you get NT minus one smaller than zero. And thus the isotropic gravitational waves background is even more suppressed. And we hope to be sensitive to an isotropic correction of the two point function, nonlinear correction, which are expected to be proportional to the FNL of two gravitons on one scalar. Thus, this is the general picture. What is the main topic of this talk? Now consider that in the literature, concerns about the observability of primordial non-Gaussianity in single feed inflation have been advocated starting from uh, 2013 with this series of paper, where it is claimed that the consistency relations can be canceled thanks to a spatial diffeomorphism. Nothing less than a change of frame, passing from a moving frame to conformal Fermi coordinates. Fermi coordinates that are conformal to Friedman is the domain cost. The claim is that this FNL, primordial FNL, can be cancelled, but this has catastrophic consequences because you can cancel automatically the FNL defining the yellow bias scale dependence, and in a very similar way, you can find the cancellation of tensor forces. But now consider that in our paper, we focused on the scalar set. Consider that the action is always a scalar under this spatial diffeomorphism. We argue that if R is a scalar under the so claimed transformation, you automatically get that the gauge variation of the B spectra is equal to zero. Thus, you cannot cancel the FNL in this case. So, the aim of the entire discussion is to argue that R is a good scalar under this class of transformation. Now, what is the source of the problem? Let me define what I mean with K equals zero word. Now, K equals zero, if you want, is partial infinity or if you are working with a gradient expansion, it's the zero order of your gradient expansion. And what you expect to see? The validity of the cosmological principle. You want to recover the friedman robertson worker metric, an homogeneous and isotropic universe. And if you consider, for instance, a Sitter expansion, what you get? The SO41 algebra, which means that you have a theory invariant under spatial translation, spatial rotation, dilatation of spatial coordinates, and spatial conformal transformation. I will show you that it is always a game of spatial dilatations. Indeed, at k equals zero, you have the freedom of a gauge redundancy. And what is a gauge redundancy? Take, for instance, a starting commoving gauge, um, where E that is fixed by setting E and V equal to zero. In this particular gauge, the three metric tensor is perfectly diagonal. And what you get that the Newtonian potential is equal to the commoving curvature perturbation. If you apply a spatial dilatation, your final gauge is again a commoving gauge. But what you get is delta E equals zero, delta V equals zero, the redundant condition, but your diagonal components are shifting, and you are losing the gauge invariance of the commoving curvature perturbation. Thus, the commoving curvature perturbation is not a good scalar under this class of transformation. Intuitively, you can imagine that it's like you are canceling constant pieces from the commoving curvature perturbation and you are building a local scale factor at infinity. And of course, a local scale factor is not a, an observable. More formal is that any single feed inflationary models can be seen as the spontaneous breaking of SO41 down to rotation and translation. Dilatation is a broken symmetry. The goldstone of your theory is the commoving curvature perturbation, which is shifting to restore at the nonlinear level this symmetry. And now there are two strange applications of this strange kind of behavior in the literature. One is given by the Weinberg theorem, and finally, the consistency relation itself. Let me start with the Weinberg theorem, because I think it's a fundamental theorem of cosmology. And for the first time in 2003, you can find the application of dilatation in cosmology. And now this is the statement. You are in the limit k to zero, so spatial infinity. You have only one scalar degree of freedom, which is a synonym of absence of entropic perturbation, and you have a vanishing anisotropic stress tensor. Under this hypothesis, uh, zeta, r, but any other curvature perturbation, they are all equivalent and conserved in time. Now, I don't want to give you the full demonstration, but I want to give you an idea of, this, of the demonstration. Uh, the point is that, of course, k equals zero, it's not physical in the sense we cannot prove k equals zero. But under the validity of this hypothesis, you can match this unphysical world with the physical world, k different from zero, 
where we have the adiabatic modes in this case. And if you are at k equals zero, you can easily realize that any uh, redundant metric variation is a trivial solution of the Einstein equation. But by looking at the space space Einstein equation, you can find the condition, which is given by the equality of the two Newtonian potential in absence of an isotropic strength tensor. Imposing this uh, equivalence, you promote one of these lambda to be a physical solution. And the physical lambda is given by the k equals zero mode of the commoving curvature perturbation. And thus, you are, you are demonstrating that exists a constant solution of the Einstein equation. Now, this is only a mathematical trick, but the important message is that you are extracting the structure of your physics from a gauge redundancy. And surprisingly, the same holds for the consistency relation. As I told you, you can find a lot of beautiful paper where it's claimed that a single feed inflation can be interpreted as the spontaneous breaking of time diffeomorphism. In a particular limit, this coincides with the breaking of SO41 down to rotation and translation. Thus, the dilatation is a symmetry nonlinear linearized, and what you can find, you can find in either current and the charge related to this symmetry. And you can compute world identities and extract from the world identities the three-point function the squeezed limit. And this is nothing less than a more elegant rewriting of the Maldacena consistency relation. But what is the point? At k equals zero, you have the freedom to shift the very long modes of the commoving curvature perturbation to zero. And if you do so, you are shifting to zero the long power spectrum. And thus, the Maldacena consistency relation is simply gauge artifacts in this limit. But what happens when we are outside k equals zero in the physical world? And if you want, the um, fundamental question is that can we compare CFC transformation or any other kind of transformation used in the literature to cancel Maldacena consistency relation with a purely constant dilatation? We think that the answer is negative because it is always a selection of commoving curvature long modes thanks to a more implicit or explicit window function. And what is the point? You have the form dilatation. This lambda function is slightly space dependent. And if you compute for simplicity at the first order the uh, metric tensor variation, you get the presence of these additive out, out diagonal terms, which are first order in a gradient expansion. But the point is that we cannot neglect this term, the gradient expansion, because you can easily realize that they are of the same order of lambda itself. And if you take into account these terms, what you get, that any change in the metric tensor can be explained by the birth of a new E scalar, the out diagonal scalar. Thus, we are changing our gauge, and we are perfectly restoring the gauge invariance of the commuting curvature perturbation. So we have a disagreement because we get a discontinuity in the gradient expansion. And we get that the commuting curvature perturbation is a good scale, a scalar under this class of transformation. And now, as I told you, R is a good scalar, at least at the first order in perturbation theory. This is sufficient to affirm that the gauge variation of the DP spectra is equal to zero. I do not have much time, but please, in our paper, you can find two independent demonstrations uh, of this statement. What you get is that the gauge variation of DB spectra is always defined by boundary terms as spatial infinity. So we achieved our goal in the sense that if you cannot gauge away the very long modes of the commoving curvature perturbation, of course, thanks to the Poisson equation, you cannot gauge away the long modes of matter perturbation defining the yellow bias skill dependence. And thus, the yellow bias skill dependence is a genuine physical quantity, and we expect that it's observable in principle by uh, high sensitivity experiments. And let me conclude with a few sentences about the tensor forces. Now, in the literature, you can find the cancellation of tensor forces. Why this? Because this is the complete Weinberg transformation. We focus only on the scalar sector, but you have this additive term. This omega matrix is constant, symmetric, traceless, and transverse. This is a spin two component. At k equal to zero, you can find this transformation rule. You are shifting the very long moves of the gravitational waves by careful choosing this omega matrix. But if you consider k different from zero, if you consider a deformed omega matrix, you get the restoring of the gauge invariance of the gravitational waves. 
that we are simply writing another paper to see what happens uh, at the B spectrum of gravitational waves in the squeeze limit. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much for your presentation.